I'm Dylan Thomas, and welcome to the Gentle Pervert Social Club. This isn't your tycoon grandfather's exclusive social club. Come on in, we're all perverts here. Just to be prepared, once you step inside, you may hear the offensive, the obscene, the outrageous. You'll also hear the honest, the heartfelt, the uncomfortable, the questioning, the struggling. We're all working for a better tomorrow, so join us while we discuss the today, while we wear top hats, monocles, or even nothing at all at the safe place we call the Gentle Pervert Social Club. Greetings, perverts. Today we have five opportunities for you to sit down at the social club, relax, listen, and possibly disagree about every damn thing you hear, but that's okay. We'll start out with a discussion about bisexual visibility, and what it means to be queer, about men losing their agency, and about writing rules, eh, because boobs. You can safely assume it's from men's perspectives, specifically Cooper S. Beckett's and mine. We'll also take a journey through pussy shame and into pussy confidence with Michelle Renee. We'll also enjoy a bit of wine and cheese during a pre-date chat with Ginger and the Professor. And we'll visit a live Chicago-based sex-positive variety show, Menage Aha, and listen to Cooper tell us about how to hide a sex swing. Oh, and uh, we'll listen to me draw a line in the sand on swinger complicity. So, I remembered a conversation from a while ago with my friend and co-host Cooper S. Beckett about his choice to passionately identify publicly as bisexual male, but not necessarily as queer. We slap each other with a bit of uh, a David Hasselhoff thumbs up sticker and try to pull an understanding of what it means to be queer and hit quite a bit of topics along the way to my making a new rule because boobs. Uh, what, when was it that you were talking about uh, that it was really important to you to be more visible as a, a bisexual man for bisexual visibility purposes than something else? What was that something else, first of all? Do you remember the conversation? And then queer. Ah, yes. Okay. Because, I I mean, I, I don't really like the terms pansexual and omnisexual because they seem uh, superfluous, and maybe it's because they overlap. Mm-hmm. And really, so the closest thing that fits is queer, and I sort of feel like I'm co-opting something that has far bigger a movement under it. Okay. You know, Queer is indicative of so many things, and uh, bisexual is something that needs more visibility when it comes to men. And it's just a state of being. I mean, it's self-evident. It's not necessarily a uh, yeah. You're not well, that's a statement, right? That's the easiest thing about it. Is I say that people, regardless of their lifestyle or community understand what i'm saying Mm -hmm. and they don't need the finer details so you know whereas if i say pansexual omnisexual or queer queer they think i'm gay right off the bat because queer has that cash to it Mm -hmm. and pansexual and omnisexual okay now what does that mean and then I have to explain what that means. Mm-hmm. And it it doesn't really make the point it needs to make. Yeah, Whereas I'm... being a bisexual male emphasizes a part of the community that is ignored. It's not even marginalized. It's really just ignored to the point of invisibility. Well, I feel I feel like queer is is a very it's it's a pretty bold statement. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of saying that we're doing a lot of queer things. Like we've queered up our marriages, we've queered up our relationships, um, and we're kind of queering the world a little bit every day that we're out talking to people and, you know, introducing them to bold new ideas about stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but identifying as queer feels like something as, as somebody that doesn't, I, I, I don't feel queer. Uh, I don't feel like I should identify as queer. I'm a, I'm a straight, relatively affluent dude, and I don't feel like I have any, uh, I, I feel like I can be part of the community, but I don't feel like I need to be one of them. Uh, like, you know, th- okay, so there's this problem with, like, well, you're hetero. Well, yeah, I, I'm also, I'm also hetero. I mean, that's, that's, that precludes you, I think. I mean, unless, I, I unless queer has, has taken on 
another form. Well, because as far as I am concerned, queer is uh, a sexual identity. It, it's it's a it's a self identity. It doesn't necessarily have to imply. You know, you you can be queer and straight uh, because it's kind of a self identifying mode of being, I guess. And and what I was going to mention was like you know how white people can get so excited about being allies sometimes to say minorities that they they get a little bit too outspoken about loving the blacks or loving, you know, the brown people or whatever because they're totally down with them and they have lots of friends. Mm-hmm. Uh and I think a lot of like uh, uh, I think a lot of straight people really get excited about queer culture and they'll say, "Hey, I'm going to shave the sides of my head and and show a lot of solidarity and and like that that means that they're part of it." Uh, even though they're just really excited about it and like, you know, look at all the queer friends I have. It's awesome. Right. Uh, and I don't think that, I don't think it means the same thing as saying and living queer. So like queer visibility is a real thing. And I think that there really needs to be, uh, I guess a more popular discussion about what queer means now that we're not just calling gay men, the queers. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's also a little harder to chew for people that don't know really what's going on in the different communities. And so uh, I think a nice stepping stone to that is bisexual male, because it's still different enough and othered enough and not really understood or acknowledged as a thing, like you were saying, that uh, starting that conversation is really important and uh, can move people that otherwise didn't really know it was a thing. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that you care about that enough to really say you know what i'm a bisexual man because of that and it specifically matters in the swing community when so many people who are bisexual men are outwardly pretending to be straight Mm -hmm. when they don't want to pretend to be straight you know if you're bisexual and you want to pretend to be straight that's fine whatever but if you would rather be visible as a bisexual then you should be, and you should feel like you can be, and a lot of them don't. You know, I wonder how many feel that way just because it's easier, or because they feel like they might be, they might feel threatened or other because, uh, because they would. Oh, I think that's the majority of people. It's it's fear of what will happen if I come out as bisexual. Will the swing community close its doors to me? Will I no longer be welcome at my local swing club? And will my friends think that I will violate all sorts of boundaries and leap all over them? (laughs) Right. Uh, You know, and what's really funny, and I was on Tristan's show this past weekend, and I think it was the first time I'd really spoken to this idea that I had, that who is afraid of bisexual males? It's not the women. The straight men. They may not want to see it, but they're not concerned about it. It's the men who are suddenly afraid of being come on to and have that not be welcome or have someone not listen when they say no or have someone push them and say, no, nah, you like it, right? And it occurred to me that what it is, is these men are afraid that what they've been doing to women forever Uh is going to be done to them. They're afraid that they're going to start moving around the world equally as vulnerable as women. Yeah. Huh. And that's terrifying to them. The idea that someone with agency and I mean, it really, it, if you, if you follow this train of thought to the end it says some really horrible things about the way these guys view women in the lifestyle and i don't know that that's 100 percent what's going on but i think there's definitely a deep subconscious fear based on the way they have treated women in the past the way they see women being treated the fluidness of consent which isn't really fluid. Well, doesn't it really speak to like how how much women have had to deal with boundary violations or flat out uh, 
you know, different variants of assault throughout their entire lives. And, uh, yeah. And, and that even men thinking about being touched by somebody that might be sexually attracted to them that they're not interested in is, is terrifying. Uh, I, and, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think somebody has to have been treating women poorly to be afraid of that, but I do think that that logical train and, you know, starting from the point of view, that's absolutely valid. And, uh, it should really make people think. And, and, you know, I, I even, I've actually been telling people lately, even, um, the, uh, you know, I, I, we've at one time talked about the older generation of swingers and that, uh, and, and I think the, everybody is still really well-meaning, but I think that the consent protocol is a little bit outdated. Mm. And so I can go into, uh, a, a swing club that, that I am comfortable in, that I'm comfortable bringing my friends into and know that, um, that asking before you touch is pretty standard and acknowledged. But if I go to a random, uh, swinger club that I've never been to, uh, or some swing clubs that I have been to that aren't, that are a little bit outdated, uh, I tell people you can expect to be touched and have to say no in response. And I almost universally, I mean, it, you know, if, if swinger clubs didn't fly under the radar, they wouldn't exist. So I can tell you almost universally when that happens in a club and somebody's told no, it's an immediate, oh, okay. It's not always taken great, but there aren't a lot of secondary boundary violations after that. It's, I mean, there, there are zones of, uh, non-passage for unaccompanied men. And there are people around that, uh, while that initial boundary violation isn't a big deal, it's those secondary ones where somebody looks like they need help. It's like everybody will pounce. And so I'm, right. I'm both accepting of the outdated boundary violation as a thing that's there, but still kind of happy that there's still this universal, this universal, uh, acceptance that everybody's responsible for protecting everybody else at a swing club. Yeah, it's it's funny because the older generation of swingers and older doesn't need to be age, older just needs to be doing this longer mm -hmm. has a it it is just more flexible. And I think that's not their fault. That's a product of what they've been shown forever. And that ultimately comes to being a product of essentially rape culture and it can be as simple as i'm going to put my hands on you and then then ask how you like that rather than can i put my hands on you and then do it mm -hmm. and it's it's something that can't be immediately changed and the value is in demonstrating the good habits and talking about the habits and talking about the ways consent is given and taken. And that's why I like to talk about how um, the best thing we can do is learn how to say no and learn how to say yes, because clear and direct communication is very important. I, and our no is just as important as our yes. And I've, um, especially when in spaces where you're kind of prepared for something like that, uh, I think there's a lot of value in learning how to say no in both a, a strong way, but an understanding way. Mm -hmm. And and I say that being a guy, you know, I, I don't have to walk in uh, a club that I haven't been into before and worry about being touched unsolicited too much. Uh, it's gen It is generally accepted that at... Pretty much all swinger clubs, women will be able to touch pretty much whoever they want, and that's pretty much okay. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it's just a a gender imbalance in in how it happens right now, and it's not terribly unwanted either. Uh, well, the thing people. about it is, it it may not be unwanted, but it is a discussion worth having. Yeah, because it's a weird double standard then, and and it calls into question that old idea that men are happy to be touched by and fuck anyone. And that's simply not true. It's also a flipping of the power dynamic. I mean, it's a place where women can all of a sudden be on top. And well, yes, but is that okay? 
No, no that, it, that now they they. I mean, either either way, it's a consent violation because sure. it's not asked for in advance. So it. It's it's a weird thought to think that, OK, well, now you're in charge. It's why I've always bristled at the idea that women are in charge in the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of anybody being in charge because that immediately suggests power dynamic differentials and the the issues that crop up from power dynamic differentials. I would just argue it's a little less bad. If that makes <laughs> sense. I, mean, you know, I, I know it's it's still it's still not great, but it is definitely not. As, well, it's a little less bad until somebody touches you that you don't want touching you. Sure. And and, and I, then it's just as bad. Fair enough. I mean, you're right. I'm 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 happy to be touched most of the time by most of the people who touch me. But not everybody. Mm -hmm. And because of that, really that should be the that should be the baseline. Because I don't want to be touched by everybody. And there are a lot of women who like being touched by most of the people who come up to them at these parties. And that's also okay. They can like that. But the baseline has to be no one. Because otherwise it just gets confusing and muddy. <laughs> and then that's, that's where the issues crop up. Because if it's okay for this person to touch you without asking, why is it not okay for this person to touch you right. without asking? Still, I, I feel much better now about, you know, wanting to bring people to clubs and say, this is how it is. If you're, if you can accept that and be okay with that, then, then let's go. And maybe, you know, a strong, confident no and a request to ask before touching can mm -hmm. lead both to a, a change in, um, a change in perspective and maybe something interesting. Oh, I, I firmly agree that that, that needs to be the step because that's how the change happens. It's not uh, flipping out when someone does something that just seems to be part of the okay dynamic. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important from within the swinger community to have everybody start exercising their nose. Because that is when things will start changing. When a guy who's touched all sorts of people without asking but has never gotten a no and has never gotten a complaint thinks that that's the way he should be able to interact. What he needs more than anything else is a handful of no's and not freak out. No's just no, you know? And you know what? That, that, that is also the gateway to accepting by men in the lifestyle because once, it is. once you're used to accepting no's and then saying no to other people and not having it be a big deal, you may not think that the bi guy is just going to wander into the room and leap on you, right, whether right. you're interested or not, <laughs> because that's what they think for whatever reason. It, it It's perplexing, actually. Uh, perplexing, but, you know, now that we understand it, we can, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we figured that out here today. We did. High five, bi man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And to be clear, I don't feel that every swinger who is not interested in hanging out with a bi guy has been abusive towards women. No, no, I, yeah, I don't. Th I didn't think you said that. <laughs> I, I don't think you came across that way either. So I do think, though, that it is indicative of the culture. It's it's this weird little side effect of the culture of the way men and women interact, both in and out of the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And realizing that that may be far more responsible for the bi male discrimination is a really fascinating direction to look. Because a lot of people thought, and still do think, and it might be, that the reason bi men are discriminated against is because it's a lingering after effect of the discrimination against gay men. Because they, quote, I'm making sure you know I'm quoting, <laughs> are responsible for transmitting AIDS. You know, that was the, the prevailing thought in for, for at least a decade after AIDS showed up. Mm -hmm. And then as we work to chip that away, there's still this idea that, hey, well, if you're bi, you are 
far riskier than this other couple we're playing with who doesn't always use condoms. Despite the fact that you always use condoms. It's just bi men are riskier, you know? Right. And we've had those little ideas drilled into us long enough that they sort of take over as facts in our head. And it it's true, uh, anal sex is the most risky of all the sex acts. But ultimately, condoms really, 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 really mitigate that risk. And unprotected oral sex is riskier, essentially. Which is also generally accepted. Yeah. <laughs> as, as, uh, it It is. Yeah. <laughs> And since it seems to be the only thing I can talk about lately, the unprotected oral sex problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was uh, I was just talking with somebody I was with yesterday about how I haven't practiced unprotected oral sex in a long time because my wife doesn't so much enjoy it. And yes, everybody, that maybe I'm just really bad at it. Who knows? Uh, or maybe just like I don't necessarily prefer blowjobs. She doesn't necessarily prefer oral. I prefer to think of it that way. Because honestly, I used to be fucking great at oral. <laughs> and uh, I kind of, I, I miss the taste and I miss the you've, feeling. You've let, the, you've let your your skills wane. Well, I, I think so because I haven't had unprotected oral sex uh, in a long time. And I mean, it, it, I, I have within the last few months. But again, it was like few and far between since then. And so like I, I, I miss having everything all over me you know like being all immersed in somebody yeah uh, and, it, and it's great and it is one of those things that i've now made a rule about not doing with people um uh, even even now that i am in uh more committed relationships with people i just don't do it because i i care about not transmitting something or not getting something and uh it, it's something that I still need to to play with a little bit in order to get more confident with oral barriers, but I've definitely mm-hmm. made that a rule for myself. I don't have unprotected oral sex anymore. Well, and, you know, it's I'm not pretending in any way that it's just as good. Because it's not. We all know that. It is not just as good protected. Neither is sex. Neither is penetrative, penis in vagina, penis in anus, whatever. That is not just as good when you add barriers into it. Now, I actually... It's still good. Yeah. But it does change the sensations. Well, okay. So I'd argue that uh, on that twice. I I think that the the amount, the more, the, the added amount of sex that you can have without worry... Uh, well, no, no, that's better, completely right? different. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I mean, that, that that's. I, I know that's not what you're talking about. I'm just saying. Number one, that's an ad benefit. But number two, and that uh, should definitely weigh into your decision. Sure. Because worry, I mean, a lot of people just don't worry, which is a problem all by itself. <laughs> and, but yes, worry can ruin shit. And and number two, I think sometimes that the change in feel can also be a net benefit, especially for. For people that maybe want to last a little longer or that have friction problems uh, or oh, that yeah. want to mix it up with two different kinds of lube. I mean, some people are sensitive to lube that has glycerin in it. Um, so that means that a lot of um, a lot of aqua-based lubes are out and they don't necessarily like the feel of silicon. Uh, but you do. And so, you know, you can change things up when you're wearing a condom. Sure. Uh, or if you like... Uh, the, the heated lube or the cool lube and you know that other person is going to freak out if they get some some of that on there then you can mix it up and so i think that well i, I think you i think it's great that you found good reasons to wear condoms well i just think that like specifically i haven't quite figured out the oral barrier thing uh and how to make that a a, a force multiplier for sexiness but i feel like a condom is another tool to do that i mean i still fuck my wife with a condom sometimes uh, you know, if I'm out somewhere and and she needs a little more lubrication and I don't necessarily have a, a lube packet in my pocket, but I have a condom in my pocket that has some lube. And so all of a sudden, we don't have to, if we just want to get a quickie out, you know, we don't have to wait to get warmed up. We can just fucking do it. And it's great. So 
you know, we wouldn't have had the sex otherwise, but we got to have the sex because easy cleanup and the lube that's on the condom and, and boom, it's done. I just think it's a really nice tool that works in a lot of different ways. And so I, I it, that's just how I feel about it. Well, here, you know, it, it's like any other rule in your relationship. You define what makes you comfortable. You define what makes this work for you. And you make that your rule. And it's, it's really playing to everybody's safest comfort level, you know, because there's no compromise with that. If, if you're only comfortable with sex at this safety level, then you, you can't meet them halfway, you know? It takes a lot of the complication out. It's like if I'm only conf confident in, in sex with condoms and you want to have sex with no condoms, there really is no compromise there. It's just you have to be confident in your rules and and s stick by your your personal safety. Yeah, I will tell you the the one of the hardest rules that I've ever made for myself is to not have mm. sex on the first date. And it, yeah, I, I <laughs> you know I I don't do that much anymore. Have sex on the first date. Like I I feel like uh I I didn't make mis well oh no okay I I made mistakes by not listening to myself and getting all excited by say boobs. Uh, and you do get excited by boobs. I do. And then kind of everything else goes out the window and I forget, like, am I actually attracted to the whole person or am I just attracted to the boobs? And sometimes the answer is, I don't know, but I end up fucking them anyway. And I'm like, Hmm, you know, I'll turned out the boobs. Yeah. And boobs is not a whole person, believe it or not. <laughs> and and i just uh i i was t i was so tired of like ending up with people i mean it didn't happen a lot but i was tired of the guesswork of like do i really want to fuck this person or not oh i'll just fuck him anyway that i said you know what this is this is stupid let me just say no and then i get to sleep on it without them and mm -hmm. if i still want to fuck them then absolutely yes that sounds great and that rule has really worked out well for me but i actually just made another one Okay. Because uh, along with boobs distracting me, I also get very distracted by people that want to give me lots of attention. And I tend to say, you know what? I'm going to go do this crazy thing. I'm going to spend the day with you. Because that sounds like a great idea for, you know, spending time with somebody that I don't know too well. And then I realize, you know, a couple hours in, you know, I would have loved to just have spent a couple hours with you, but I, I can't. I can't maintain a an interest for an entire day to somebody that I'm not absolutely interested in. And the thing is, like, oh, if well, I went to hard. yeah, like if I went to a club and then found somebody that I talked to for five or ten minutes and then said, "Okay, let's spend a day together," that would be stupid. But for some reason, if I'm not in a club and I just meet a friend out who has a friend that it sounds that seems interesting, and then all of a sudden I make a day date with them or an overnight date or well, something. What are you making day dates and overnight dates for? <sighs> because girls are pretty, and I like <laughs> girls. Yes, and... yes, just like the boobs, you get distracted. I do, and uh... I mean, I would, I would definitely not make overnight dates until I've had at least a couple non overnight dates and now i completely agree with you because i've had one too many times where i've said you know what i i i just don't really want to be here and i don't and and, and as much as i'm comfortable saying no hmm. if you said you know what let's spend the entire day together and then two if hours i in, said that <laughs> okay if i've said let's spend the whole day together or if they've said it and i've said yes and then two hours later you're like uh, you know, how do, how do I extract myself from this without being insulting? Because there's a difference between saying like, you know what? No, thanks. Not now. And right. no, thanks. Not now. And let's spend the next 10 hours together. Uh, or no, thanks. And then the, the entire day is like, wow, he really didn't like me. There, There's this like, uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm okay with respecting my own feelings. But when there's a lot of potential um, hurt that will happen because of it. I'm kind yeah. of willing to sacrifice myself a little bit to make to to not hurt somebody else. And well, I think in a way you're taking one for a team for the team. I am taking one for the team that I'm not on. 
<laughs> well, no. At the moment, you're on that team. You're you're on team date, and by taking one for the team, you are disregarding your ultimate feelings and happiness in favor of the other half. So you want the team to win, mm -hmm. and it's going to win at your expense, with you or without you. It's going to win, you know? <laughs> and and that's. I know why you're doing it. I get it. Absolutely. And have done it. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's what, that, that seems to be what keeps getting you into this troublesome area is you, you are forgetting what you want and need, you know, your needs are just as valid as their needs. And just because you are on a date with them, that is going great for them. They're getting what they want out of it. So awesome because that is awesome. But if you're not, why, why is their, uh, value proposition any better than your value proposition? Yeah. Which is why I and now made that. Rule. I've seen you get into <laughs> these troubles for a long time now. Yeah. Yeah. You have. Yes, you have. And I think what it is, you know, it, it's it's ironic that we we talk about um, not having sex on the first date thing, because y you you might need to slow the entire process down, <laughs> <laughs> or at the very least, you know, like I made a conscious decision to be upfront with the idea that I don't plan what dates are ultimately going to be. I don't plan when I'm, when I'm making a date with someone, is this going to be a poly relationship that lasts a long time? Is this going to be a swing relationship where we get together and fuck occasionally, or is this going to be a one night stand or are we just going to be friends? Those are really the option. Or are we going to never see each other again? Because I guess that's an option. Now too. see that I'm pretty you know? good at. I'm pretty good at not placing any particular expectations on somebody. I don't know. You're making full day dates, which sounds an awful lot like poly dating. Well, th that, that whole day date usually happens because there's this thought that we're going to spend the whole day fucking. And well, yeah, yeah. And, and the thing, <laughs> the thing I realized is, you know what? I really only want to spend the whole day fucking somebody that I really like. Yeah. And I just can't sustain that level of attention. I think whole day fucking is like 10th date. That's probably about right. I think you need to push that one back. But I'm ready to fuck now. <laughs> I want to do it. <laughs> no, and you know, I've had that terrible realization. You know, we met some people at Desire one year and then they came and visited us and we were not clicking and it was none of our specific faults. You know, it was just different environment meant very different interaction. Mm -hmm. And they came to visit us from out of town. Yeah. What do you do with that then? Mm -hmm. You know, at, at what point do you all just shake hands and say, well, fuck this? You know? Uh <laughs> and that's that's the danger of that kind of out of town thing. It's, it's the reason why when I'm meeting people that I've talked to for a while at like a conference or at desire that I I've tried to start making it clear. I'm not looking for a girlfriend for the weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I'm not looking to, to uh, get together and fuck on Thursday night and then Friday night and then Saturday night. And then Sun because it, it, because I've, I'm, gotten into that kind of trouble in the past yeah and i've gotten into that kind of trouble in the sense that both of us thought the other person was looking for a full weekend boyfriend slash girlfriend you know it's funny i'm actually pretty good at avoiding that too i really need to integrate these two sides of me it's like i'm really, <laughs> you really good in a few different ways and i'm really really bad in another way well, no, it's it's your objective brain is not a being allowed to talk to your <laughs> booby distracted brain. <laughs> your booby distracted brain, and you know and what? Where does it that actually, live in my head? your booby distracted brain is falling in love with the boobies uh, and is starting to plan uh, living arrangements with the boobies. With the boobies, <laughs> and living arrangements start with let's spend the entire day together. <laughs> you know, because twelve to eighteen hours of waking time that's nothing i mean i don't 
I don't like to spend 12 to 18 hours of waking time with most people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are, there are a couple, but very, very few people do I want to spend that kind of time one-on-one -on -one with. Hey, Cooper. Yes. Am I one of them? I don't, I don't think you like to spend 12 to 18 hours with me either. <laughs> I, th I think we are better off with, with more bite size. Uh, let's not plan a day date. Okay. Well, let's, yeah, we... we can hang out in the evening. Okay. And we can play a board game. Okay. And then see where that goes. All right. How about that? I I'm, I'm good at leaving it undefined like that. All right. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. I like that too. All right. It's a date. But I, yeah, I don't want to go on a weekend retreat with you. Just the two of us. Okay. I don't, you don't want to do that, right? I mean, we, this isn't, this isn't a breakup conversation, right? <laughs> it's okay. You don't have any boobies for the booby side of my brain to fall in love with. No, I don't. So. I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. <laughs> I spoke with Cooper S. Beckett, and you can find him on Twitter at SwingSetLife and at LifeOnTheSwingSet.com slash author slash Cooper, and at a little known sister podcast of ours called Life on the Swing Set. He also podcasts about the show's Twin Peaks on a Damn Good Podcast and about Hannibal on Eat the Rootcast. Michelle Renee first caught my attention while lamenting some pretty terrible OkCupid dates, and even though I'm still waiting for her to tell us all about them, you know, with her voice, she was wonderful enough to stand up and tell us about how she found Pussy Confidence. Today I want to talk about Pussy Confidence. It's a big deal. I don't know if people realize how many women are affected by a lack of pussy confidence and how it affects their lives, but if you're with a woman who doesn't like her pussy, trust me, there are going to be issues, mainly in oral sex. I remember with a boyfriend when I was 16 or 17, and he wanted to go down on me, and I let him, but I was mortified, which meant I was in my head the whole time. I thought he's going to reject me for either not liking the way my pussy looked or the way it tasted or the way it smelled. I didn't like it. How in the world was anybody else going to like it? So, of course, you know, his efforts were useless. There was no way I was going to have an orgasm. I couldn't relax. Um, even if the room had been dark, I think I would have been a mess. I ended up married at 19 and I had a lot of trust in my husband. And so I let him go down on me and I actually could enjoy it, but it was never something I asked for. And at times in our marriage, I'm not even sure it's, it was something that he enjoyed doing, but it was, it happened. I could get off with it, but it certainly wasn't on my wish list. And back then, honestly, I was a single orgasm girl. So it was a way to reach orgasm, but it wasn't my favorite way. Sometimes I wonder where I got my thoughts about my pussy, because I never actually had anybody say anything negative about my pussy. I was the only one that was trashing on my pussy, which is really sad to look back at. But at almost 40 years old, it wasn't until last year that I could say, honestly, I love my pussy and loving my pussy has changed my life. I ended up running into an article about Betty Dotson in the spring of last year and I fell in love with her and I listened to everything I could everywhere on the internet. I, she was on my bucket list. I was going to meet Betty Dotson someday. One of the things that resonated about her to me was that she also struggled with body acceptance, mainly her vulva. And so when she was younger, after her first marriage, she was with a lover who wanted to shine a light on her pussy and just take a really good look at it. And she was mortified. And I could so relate because if somebody had asked me to do that, I probably would have just broke down crying. Um, panic attack, anxiety, everything, just because I didn't want to look at it. Why in the world would anybody else want to look at it? Well, Betty let her boyfriend Grant look at her pussy, and his reaction was something to the effect of, you have my favorite kind of pussy. And she thought, favorite kind of pussy? She thought she was deformed because she had 
larger inner labia, so they hung down past her outer labia. Um, they were uneven. She thought she had a deformity. He ran and got some girly magazines and let her flip through them. In in 15 minutes of looking at other people's vulvas, she was cured of her of her hatred of her pussy. She realized that every pussy is different and they're all beautiful and hers could be admired too. And when I read that or heard her tell that story, I really, really connected to that because I always felt like I didn't like the looks of my pussy. It didn't look like the the girls in the porn. Um, they have these nice, beautifully balanced inner and outer lips and everything just looks great. And that wasn't mine. At about that same time is when my marriage ended. And I, I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't found a way to love my pussy. Because having sex with new partners would have been an absolute nightmare. Thankfully, I was having a conversation with a dear friend of mine. And we got on the topic of labia. He happened to like large labia. And I thought, oh my goodness, um, I think I have large labia and I hate them. A couple of weeks later, I worked up the nerve to take a picture of my pussy. And I was actually really impressed with it. I had tried doing this so many times over the years. I had a friend of mine that I used to trade naughty pictures with on occasion. And he would always request a vulva shot and I couldn't do it. There was no way... I could look at my pussy, let alone let somebody else criticize it. Because, of course, I assume they would criticize it because I didn't like it. How could anybody else like it? Well, I liked this picture, finally, for the first time, summer of 2014. And because I liked it, I went ahead and sent it over to my friend, knowing that he would at least be kind to me. And his words were, oh, my gosh, you don't have large labia. And oh my gosh, it was like this huge weight fell off my shoulders. And I said, I don't, I don't know why it matters. But for me, I like suddenly adjusted how I looked at myself. And I was so proud of that picture. I sent it off to a girlfriend and I sent it off to a guy that I had been talking to. And I sent it off to that old friend that I'd shared naughty pictures with. Everybody gave me great feedback And it built my confidence up and it changed everything. In the fall of 2014, I actually was able to take Betty Dotson's body sex workshop. I had already done a lot of the work for the workshop because I had already fallen in love with my own pussy. But to sit in a room with other women and experience what is Betty Dotson was an amazing weekend and total bucket list shit. Now I'm a woman dating with pussy confidence, and I can say I'm multi-orgasmic and I love oral sex. So, fellas, ladies, if you've got a partner that doesn't love their pussy, that should be your first priority. Help them love their pussy. I know they have to be the ones to do it and the ones to accept themselves. But if they can love their pussy, their sex life is going to be absolutely different. And I wish everyone could just realize that, as a friend of mine says, pussies are like snowflakes and there's never two that are alike. You can find Michelle Renee's writing at sexaftermarriage.org and on Twitter at the Trojan Kitten. Ginger and the professor decided to turn on the recorder while on the way to a uh, multiple couple cheese plate date and work themselves up about past experiences, future possibilities, and signals between each other and other couples. Also, the stand-in for the hot tub as the determining factor in them closing the recording session down is a battery alarm this time. Oh, Ginger. Oh, professor. So, we are headed to a date. On a date. Yes. Well date multiple dates consolidated into one date yes right cheese plate date it's a cheese plate an unofficial cheese plate of course unofficial there is uh, still some dispute as to whether the cheese plate requires 
standard well, five, six, or right, more. Right, right, and and I think we can be flexible with that. Although I had said earlier that I thought for it to be an official cheese plate, it needed to be seven. That, that is more. that is your official position. That was my official. That that's was my official, official position. That's your official. But only because it gave me leverage in picking up the cop. Ginger. Oh yes, the cop. The cop outside the coffee shop. Yes. Uh, we were getting coffee for our date. Going into Dunkin' Donuts. I know that's cliche. <laughs> Which that uh, he was going into Dun- Dunkin' Donuts, or we were getting coffee for our date. No, that you wanted to have sex with the cop. <laughs> You wanted him to fulfill your um, oh, you're cream not gonna say donut it. fantasy. You're not gonna say it. I know there's no cream donut fantasy. That was you and your. Oh yeah, that was me. That is true. Your cringeworthy, sploshing sort of fantasy about donut holes and filling donut holes. You can totally fill your donut holes. Uh-huh. <laughs> no. I think so. It doesn't work for me. So, cops are kind of your thing. Well, <laughs> one of your things. <laughs> but, cops are sexy. Yeah. So, I just have a question, though. Okay. If you're uh, seducing a, a, an officer of the law. Yes. And this officer of the law, and I know that being bisexual, I'm going to generalize with... A, a kind of a more heteronormative okay. seduction of yes. a, a male. Because there was one who walked across the front of the it car. Happens to be the example. Well, right. Yes, right. Um, he did wave at me, too. He did, I know. Okay, and, anyway, I digress. And you, and you turned around and put your hands on the hood and stuck your ass in the air. It was really awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, officer. She sees handcuffs, and that's just what happens. She's a slut. What can I say? <laughs> so that actually didn't happen, so although it may have happened in your mind. When, when that does happen, <laughs> do you want him to keep his... Um, his his uh, belt of power. His belt of power on? You want him to stay... To, well, you don't want him to stay holstered. I know that. <laughs> no. I, I, well, I'm... The uniform is sexy. The belt of power is sexy. It plays right into a lot of my submissive tendencies. There's a lot of useful things on the belt. Yeah, sure. So he might want to keep it handy, but I would prefer if he, you know, unleashed his rippling muscles under his uniform as we were having a artrist. So you'd, you'd like the belt to come off? Make sure there's no premature firing. Nice. Nice. Yeah, no. That wouldn't be good. No early release? No. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm kind of hard now. I like that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm totally into that. That's cool. That is really hot. It was um, fun. Now I'm all distracted and I'm flushed too. It's, yeah. I suppose it's good since we're on the way to a date. We are on the way to a date and you have... Well, I think he's really done his civic duty. Absolutely. And you could have offered him to come to the cheese plate. I know. And Hop then, in the back, officer. And then we would not have to even debate as to whether seven was a full cheese plate or whether six qualified. Absolutely. Done deal. Done well, deal. no matter what, we're going to have fun. Yes, we are. We are. And I think we were um, talking earlier about, uh, in spite of our uh, our vast experience um, with <laughs> orgies, <laughs> hashtag spine of right, oh my gosh. that we don't really have a great uh, signal yet relative to... Oh, that's right. We were talking about signals. Signal relative to... You know, kind of being in group sex vibe, but also sometimes you're just like, hey, you know what? I've had enough group sex for one night. <laughs> I think I'm out of here. And when we're in sexy vacation, we can just be out of there and it's no big deal. You can do the ghost thing. Yeah, exactly. You know, you can ghost right on out of there. But when you're, you know, rolling together, then um, you don't want to be... Uh, 
want you don't want to overstay your welcome. You don't want to overstay. Oh, for your partner. You From mean. your partner's yeah, perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right, right. So we don't have a good signal. Right. And um, we've had unsuccessful trials of multiple signals. Yeah, like what? Well, just my complete misunderstanding of you bumping me under the table, which is usually yeah. incidental, and then I'm know. like, it's too subtle. It's not. It's not well, what happens. Well, most times it's incidental, and then Wait, when it's this, not is incidental, this, is this our exit? By the way, we, do we know where we're going? Well, um, I hold this, <laughs> and you look while you just giggle, just giggle the whole time. Oh my gosh! Stop. I love yeah. that we don't know where we're going. Incidental leg bumping is not a good signal because. Right. You know, sometimes you just bump legs, and then you get confused. I do. And I would not I want that to happen. I get very confused, because I always want to respond to your signals, and I always... Well, we've never had a signal, so I don't know how you respond to them. Well, okay, so let me rephrase. I always want to respond to what I think you are doing when you are supposedly giving me a signal that was not created ahead of time. Have we just ruled out like simple mind reading? Yes. I think, I think, yes. I think we very much have ruled that out. Okay. Um, and I'm going to say that we also, as we started to chat about it, um, you are multitasking. I am. You're doing that, really well. That, that's why I'm the like, cadence of your voice slows down. I know. Multitask, well, so. It's probably helpful that it slows down a bit. What I was going to say, though, is I think we came to the conclusion that 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 us having a secret handshake wouldn't be the best signal. We did discuss our fraternity and sorority handshakes, <laughs> and so then in the middle of the orgy, you just go over and shake each other's hand and pick up and leave, and then be like, oh. Oh, I think it's time for us to head out. That'd be so, that is so vastly awkward. Right. So anyone new to group sex, um, that would not... A secret handshake is not a good signal. An actual handshake is probably not the right thing to do. Right. Um, this seems like, you know, Orgy 101 stuff, so... In the fact that we don't have one. Well, yeah, I and, and I don't feel like we need a quote-unquote signal necessarily to fly under the radar with these friends. Like, no, they are, they're all friends. That's but true. let me just... Because there are other types of signals, of course. Right. If you're with new people and particularly in a group and you're right. navigating a new relationship or... You know, or you see somebody and you're just not sure. And right. It's, yeah, exactly. So there's the, like the thumbs up, thumbs down, like, hey, I... I'd be in a room in a sexy place with them, or I would be sexy with them, or I w- I'm down with you being sexy with them. Like, there's a lot of those different signals. In this case, we were talking about the specifics of of you having had lots and lots of sexy time with these ladies, and me having sexy time in the past with one of the men, and not for a really long time. And so last time we were all together in a sexy place, I actually was being sexy with someone entirely different. There was a new, there was a, uh, a fourth, a fourth couple, couple right. involved and you right. were predominantly involved with, right. I would say her really. Her. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Right. Only her. Right. And your cock was hard first. <laughs> if I do recall, yes. you were fucking her before... I pull my cock out of the bag hard. I think you were fucking her before I even had my clothes off. Well, um, maybe. Maybe. Maybe you still had your pants on. I was impressed. I was impressed. Well, she asked me to. I'm not... You no, know, it's off. I mean, I'm... Impressed is a good thing. I was... That was, was an awesome thing. Okay. So... So the whole discussion yeah, about so signals we're, was so the we're idea songs of for a couple and right. not uh, not knowing for sure how things are going to play out, but also well, I know for like, sure how some things are going to play out. I.e., the women are going to jump your bones, so you need to eat your wheaties at dinner and hydrate because you are going to be a busy man. Like, I already saw it. You already put them through their paces the last time. I'm 
I've been happily and, and very sexily text harassed by one of the women who basically wants to skip dinner just so she can get on you. I like how they text harass you. That's awesome. Oh, no. I, I love it. I think it's, it's fantastic. If well, anybody needs to hydrate, it would be her, by the way. <laughs> She's a gusher. Likely to gush. Yeah. So, so that will be hot. All of that will be hot. How it goes in my so experience, I'm it will interested. still be hot no matter what. Yeah, I just I know. don't know what I'm up for. I know. I know. That's I know. all. I know. Well, there was the, the part of the uh, newness of the last time that we saw them was the kink dynamic that was kind of in the room but not really named. Right, right. And subsequent to that we learned that that was really new for them overall right. which right. was kind of one of the couples that we're going to see tonight right. right 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 and it was something that they were totally into but hadn't really experienced before right and that was actually a surprise to me because it felt like they knew what they were doing or that they were totally cool with like how things were rolling well, I think it speaks to that energy that if if you've got some kinky in you in your in your sexual DNA, right, then it's just it feels really natural because yeah. it, it definitely felt natural with them. And, and they even, were both submissive, and that was one of the things right. that you're very comfortable being dominant. Yes, but. In a group They're, setting, it's very different, though. Uh, yeah. I mean, these, these are all friends, and, and I think everybody's open to it. But I think that one of the... I don't know if you told this on the swing set or not, but one of the uh, uh, signals, missed signals, or kind of... Well, let me just say, it kind of came all together when I realized that he was very submissive to you. Is right. At the beginning of the evening, how he was having a hard time meeting your eye and you had interpreted that as a reasonable person might be as just somebody who's not interested overall. Yeah. I mean, because I, he didn't really engage with you a lot. He was kind of awkward with exactly, you. Exactly. Didn't really have. Exactly. And, and, and I would say that it was, you know, a couple of things. The first one is my experience of that. And he's a hottie. Um, and I didn't feel like, Oh, damn it, he's not into me. I was just like, oh, okay, well, at least I know, or it, I sense that. Right. And then as it got to a sexy place and we were all in the bedroom, I was like, oh, that's what that is. So it was a very interesting experience for me to reinterpret my first impression. And the other thing that I had happen that night that I feel a little bit of tonight is going into an orgy experience or a multiple couple experience and not, not knowing what I'm up for. Like, I'm just kind of speaking to people, you know, yeah. listeners who might be listening, like, oh, you know, if I'm on my way to a sexy party or a sexy date, I need to be ready to, you know. Is that because it can go in, like, so many different directions for you? Well, you know, before I would even speak to that, I just want to say, like, I'm always game to go into a sexy place, almost always game to go into a sexy place, but also being willing to own, like, I may not be, I may not be doing, I wouldn't say doing anything. I'm always happy to be that sexy second helping hand or, you know, whatever blue girl. girl or, you know, the extra set of hands while people are having sex. Like I love that. So I'm always willing, almost always willing to do that. And you know, when I'm not like, if we're not going to, if it's not happening, if it's not going down, like right. that signal happens loud and clear and we leave. It's going but... down. <laughs> I'm yelling ginger. Oh my gosh. Stop, 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 stop. So you're going to derail what I was going to say because you had asked the question about tonight or you asked me the question about like the date that we are heading to currently. Yeah. Um, because hmm. last time, as you think about that, there was, um, we were in a kinky mood, and, and so oh, we yeah. were doing some D 
DS play and you know for segments not like that the whole time yep um, and some vlogging yep which was sexy um, and then some other folks got are, were interested in it but I think with being newbies we were not really um, encouraging them to go too far down that well, and also I think that everyone was watching, so it kind of brought the, I wouldn't say it brought the sexiness to a halt, but it brought the sexy action to just us being sexy. Right. Right. So there weren't other people having sex. There were people, other people like, you know, petting and enjoying each other's skin on skin, but people essentially stopped to watch. It was kind of an intermission. Right. So not wanting to have people lose steam or feel like they just had to get in line for the vlogger, but wanting the sexiness to, that's, yeah. that was my vision anyway. Yeah. And I think, happening. you know, there was, there was an interest in people trying the vlogger, but not necessarily like full on trying the vlogger. So we lightly vlogged some folks and they enjoyed that. But I was raising that as it relates to not knowing if folks are going to want to go down the kinky path or the pairing off path. Or right, the, you know what right, I mean? It's like right. so for me, good in the sense of there's lots of different things that could happen, all of which could be fun, but oh, all yeah. of which could just be like hanging out and enjoying a sexy vibe and watching too. Exactly. And I, I just, I don't have any expectations. I'm, I'm, definitely in a mentally sexy place and just physically feeling a little less sexy. I don't know. Like, sure. not that I don't feel sexy. I feel bodily sexy, but you I'm like... You fucking sexy. Well, thank you. Just in my body. Like, I feel a little bit like... I don't know. Yeah, we've been just, hitting, we've been hitting the gym pretty hard. Yeah, I'm like my body's a little bit sore. I mean, full disclosure, a little bit of PMS. Yeah. So yeah. you know, you I just, haven't noticed you've been you've been <laughs> such a cheery person recently. <laughs> I uh, haven't been uncheery, have I? No. I, I, have I, I've <laughs> been, I have I been rageful? No, no. I mean, you've had you've had moments of rage. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to do a spit take with her coffee. Oh my right God. Now. I almost had coffee in my nose. I've, I've had moments of rage. Okay. So that's yeah, fair. No, but, you know, it's cool. There's lots going on. You, you actually, uh, uh, yeah. So, there's, so, yeah, there's, so that's, so that's what I would say if I had a predominant reason that I am questioning what direction I want to go tonight, it is simply those things. And I, I don't have any concern or anxiety. Did you hear New Direction broke up, by the way? What? New Direction. The, 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 the band. What band? I don't even know that band. New Direction? Yeah. You don't know that band? It's not New Direction. Isn't it like One Direction? Oh, it's One Direction. Okay. <laughs> All right. Like, are you... Geraldo... <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. That was the best. What was it? It was Geraldo Rivera. No, it was... I, I got Geraldo Rivera, but he was opening up various ships. <laughs> no, so. no. It took you three or four times. Okay, we're referring back now. This is like... It's um, a throwback. It's an illusion. If we're going to, if, with the literary aspect, an allusion to the Desire cast um, from 2014 uh, was a beautiful thing. Like, you could hear the Don Julio um, flowing. Yeah. You could hear it flowing. You could hear the ice cubes and um, you could listen to you make out for a little while at the beginning, which was adorable and awesome. Yeah. Uh, we'll, but to, yeah. we'll, get an, we'll get an episode wrap. But then it, it was, was like... It was, it was hilarious, and it was. So, I don't even remember who he said whose vault it was. It was like you know, Al Capone. I mean, it was Al Capone's, but it was. I, I don't think I ever even got to the right answer. I forget. <laughs> it was, there was a lot. Oh my gosh! So, Jim, thing. before we uh, yeah, yeah. we wrap. Wait, I didn't even answer your question. Will you answer my question before we wrap up? Is that what you were going to ask? No, I have another one too, but let's answer the previous question. Oh, so. So this was the last little, I, I love that digression though. That episode makes me smile. Um, I'm not sure where I want to go tonight in terms of sexiness. However, 
I am totally up for having this happen and going there and being with these sexy friends. And I would just say for listeners who feel that anticipation, anxiety, like not the anticipation fun, but the anticipation anxiety that, you know, knowing you don't have to do anything you don't want to do ever, uh, is an important piece. And, you know, even in our vast experience, as you said earlier, I can occasionally feel a little bit of that, but then have to remind myself, like, it's cool. Like, we're going to go to dinner. We're going to go back to their house. It's going to be sexy no matter what. I'm going to watch you doing really sexy things. Yeah, and If I'm into it. I mean, don't put pressure on me, sister. Seriously, if you're into it, like, seriously. Well, I'm expecting to be into it. Okay. But, you know, things can change. You might get PMS before I mean, the, the I, I, just, I reserve the right. Sometimes I play hard to get. Do you, you want to expose all my games right now? Oh all my, gosh, all my, um, all, your moves. all my tricks, They're not games. strategies, my tricks, my strategies, right? Yeah, I don't want to expose any of those things, but I, I don't, I don't ever see them that way. You just, no. you just do your own thing. You always have. Well, and that's part of the thing, which I was going to ask you about. This is my second question, mm-hmm. but in terms of orgies, in terms of. Uh, more than a couple dates, pairing off a couple dates. Yep. I really like group sex. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things that I think is initially, like, can be intimidating because there's just so much going on where you can feel... You know, maybe I think the first time that we went into it, it was kind of like, am I going to be able to control the environment? Am I going to be able to really settle in and enjoy myself? Do I have to worry about people, you know, that I don't want touching me or, Uh you know, like, so all of those things. And I think that at least the group sex experiences that we've had where we've really patterned good communication and consent, um, in, in terms of making all of that very explicit before things get rolling and people yep. really respecting that. And yep. it, it, it's almost like the opposite where it's, it's easier to settle in because there's always something going on. And so, yeah. you know, I know that you like to watch me fuck and have fun yes. and I like to do that, but I also like to just, enjoy the sexy vibe too. Yes. And watch the sexy vibe sometimes. And sometimes there, I mean, there have been times that's mostly what I've done. Yeah. Oh, sure. And so, you know, if you can get to an orgy, do it because <laughs> it actually takes a lot of the pressure off. So you're not feeling like the person, you know, again, not, not, there, not that there's anything wrong with dates with another couple where you uh-huh. pair off, but you know, you can kind of feel like, well, if I'm not pleasing this person and they're not bisexual or whatever, like they're twiddling their thumb. So somehow you're letting them down. Whereas in group setting, like there's always something to be doing. There's yeah. always somebody to be doing. There's always setting. somebody to be doing. True. That I agree with all of what you said. I was reflecting back on what I seem to remember as our first orgy experience, which was really, really early. It was another six some. And I remember in that circumstance that a lot of times I have had my orgy experience start with someone propositioning me. So I'm thinking about the fact Propositioning that, you to go to the orgy or propositioning you... No, no, no. Like, we're at the orgy. We're at the six sum. We're at the eight sum. Or we're, you know, at the cheese plate of some sort. Right. And we're mingling and it's fun and sexy. And before the action's really getting started, someone says, Hey, Jen, what you I would love to... Or, yeah, or, yeah. Or whatever else. I'd or I'd you. love to okay. bend you over or whatever. And be like... Yeah. Okay. Right. That sounds awesome. Right. So then it takes 
anything out of like, I'm not making a decision. I mean, I made the decision to say yes to that. Right. And then that kind of starts to get the ball rolling. And I was just reflecting on those experiences, those early ones. And then another orgy that we just had recently where, where I was propositioned and I'm like, yeah, that sounds really fantastic versus me stepping up and saying, I want to do this right now to this person. Like right. it's take it's taken the the decision making out of my hands to decide who I would like to do. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's interesting because I my observation of you is uh, that you are unlikely in a group setting to make the first move. Yes, that is true. I would say that. So, true. note to viewers, to listeners, <laughs> viewers, 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 to orgy viewers, I suppose. Orgy viewers, note to listeners: if you're ever in an orgy with Ginger, make the first move. <laughs> you will not regret it. Well, there you go. Speaking of uh, the getting the ball rolling, though, we we yes. definitely need to have a shout out to our uh, DC friends. Yes. That introduced us. Um, to, uh, the, I think, a really important concept. Yes. Um, and I think this is particularly important for Ginger and me because we're nerds and we can get rolling with awesome, fun, sexy conversation in group settings. And we were doing this, actually, on the last trip to D.C. when... Our friends pulled together a, a cheese plate, and it was actually your birthday. It was. And we were hanging around, chatting, a bunch of new people, so it was fun to have time to talk to them. And then our friends came, or actually it wasn't, no, it was a new person for us, so it was... A new friend. A new friend and an old friend. And the hosting friends. And the hosting friends. Friend. Right. Male, came he stepped out, out, stepped out, stepped, and then stepped back in. Right. And when they came back in, they were in their underwear. Well, let's be clear. Underwear and a strap on. Oh, that's right. She was wearing a strap on. Right. 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 Which they have dubbed the gong. Having a gong. Right. Kind of uh, changing the vibe from awesome, sexy conversation, which you can have for a very long time. And then next thing you know, you're like, I fucking talked to my orgy away. Like, right. I literally have been talking this whole time and now people are tired and they're going home. Like, exactly. So, which makes all kinds of sense. So the idea of the gong is you change up the vibe and usually that involves taking some clothes off, which was okay with me. Oh, it was fantastic with me. Both of them naked and or mostly naked at that yeah, point. I was, yeah. uh, I was raising my hand. Yeah. Saying, she yeah. was super sexy. And he's super sexy. They were yeah, super they were. sexy. Well, I mean, Everyone I was, was commenting sexy. on, on her super sexy. I just got distracted. I tend to, to focus on being a hetero dude, her sexiness, but little did I know, cause I missed some signals along the way in, um, conversation that she was actually a lesbian. So I went to... So you were not a sexual candidate for her that night? I asked if I could kiss her, and she said, no, I'm really a lesbian. And I said, I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know you were a lesbian to begin with. Like, I wasn't trying to test your lesbianism. <laughs> I wasn't... Like, you just keep going up to someone throughout the night yeah, just no, to no, check no, if I'm they're still a lesbian. still a lesbian. Thanks, prof. <laughs> um, so but that was cool, because she, she did look really good with her... Um, cock and you know i'm all about like kissing hot women and touching their um, strap-ons and it's all fun and sexy so i was really turned on by that but you did definitely get to benefit from that um i did and so she was the gong and it is certainly something that gets an orgy going and changing and i would and say we're totally adopting it wasn't it some wasn't we're totally it like adopting within it. Within like two minutes after that, everybody else in the room was. Well, and in that, their underwear. this is why I love the gong, and this is why I love 
you know, our friends who have instituted the gong haven't really figured out. And this is what, and, and I'd love to hear from them. We're going to have dinner time conversation at some point with them about what makes a good gong. And I, before I say this, I have to tell a quick story that I was in a tea house recently and it was near closing time. And all of a sudden I'm sitting there and I'm closing drinking my tea, time. right? It was closing time. And all of a sudden I'm drinking my tea and all of a sudden I literally hear a gong, like uh, a big gong. Did and you I, take your clothes off? I, I almost did. I was almost standing naked waiting for sex in the tea house, you, but you, like, got, I realized like, just in that moment, and then yeah, and then put, I was like, oh, on wait, on and everybody shoot. was like, wait a minute. They were like, wait, wait, this is, you, you're doing it all wrong. You're in the wrong place. So, and then you giggled and somebody across the room was like, Ginger, you're on life on the swing side. Oh I know you. Goodness. Right. <laughs> so, so that happened and it was hilarious in my own mind. Like, it all happened in my mind and it was hilarious. Yeah. So, so we kind of talked about the idea of getting a real gong. Right. But, I but it doesn't say, do the like, job. I think that, and this I, I is think, what we're talking about right now. Have it, I think they have it down. The you, gong has yeah. to be explicit. Yeah. yeah. One, it has to be explicit. I.e., oh. someone needs to take their clothes off and do something sexy. Two. I have another story to tell, by the way. Okay. Does it have to do with the gong being explicit? Yes. Okay. Then, then it is a, it can, it fits here. No, I want in to the hear, outline. I want to hear your second point though. Cause it was, well, I, th- I was just going to say, there's a couple of things about the gong is one, it has to be explicit yeah. and two, it has to be well-timed timing. And that is one of the things because I think no that premature you, could, gong. you could pull the trigger on the gong a little bit fast. And then people are like, wait, I'm not done talking or they're not feeling comfortable enough to really, you know, drop their clothes. I want to say at this particular cheese plate, these friends nailed the gong because a, it was explicit. I'm going with a and B now instead of one and two, a, it was explicit because they came out and were super sexy in their underwear. And, and she was wearing the, the hot cock. And B, it was well timed because clearly it was well timed because everybody was waiting on bated breath to like drop their clothes because they were all naked and really having sex within probably what, I didn't five have any minutes. Fun. I was just watching. <laughs> no, well, actually, no, I didn't watch the whole time. But that actually is a You're good example. You're such a fibber that you didn't have fun and that you were watching. I'm like, joking. What, I know. Like, but that, I just want to say though that actually is proof. Not that I need. Um, examples to justify my point, but I spent probably 87 and a half percent of that time in that orgy watching, but I was watching you. I mean, that was super sexy because you were having an awesome threesome. Yes, it was. And, um, well, that was just part of, I mean, I think, and there act, were, I think I mean, that was act one of there, my sexy yes. fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you yeah. had many acts, which I watched all of, and okay. that was fun and sexy. And I got to see all of that. Um, the story, though, that I was going to tell about the timing and explicitness of the gong, yep. points one and B, right. were the second cheese plate party from the DC weekend was, I thought, hilarious because we were uh, hosting that night. Yes. And we had designated you as being the gong. Right. Which to my credit, I did start to do. But you also realized yeah. the gong meant, okay, we're going to be making a move, right? To being play. So you went to the bathroom and I came up with the brilliant idea that we were going to cock gong you. A cock block, but cock gong. Okay. Then, yeah. And we all hurried up and got naked so that when you came out... <laughs> so you guys were like the collective gong? We, yeah, we, we gonged you. That would have been awesome. What do you mean it would have been? Is that what happened? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, no, yes. no, no. Oh, yes, it is what happened. But but I'm circling back to the very first time I was trying to be the gong and talk about... We, we were going to do the consent circle. But we started talking about consent circles. It got really oh, meta. Remember, yeah, we had a set true. of friends who were there who we were starting the sexy consent circle. Which was actually a set of friends, just to, in, to interrupt because that's my MO, a set of friends that we were not sure how everybody was going to mesh, right? So the consent 
discussion. Well, I wouldn't say mesh. We weren't sure like where everybody was in timing and who could stay in play and all of that yeah. stuff. So it wasn't even about personalities mas- mashing. It was about well, like okay. what could actually what what could actually transpire. Like everybody was in a different place that night. Okay, so fair. that's how I was was thinking of it. But yeah. when I first started to have that conversation, the sexy consent circle conversation, then our friends who were new to that experience, because I think everyone else had had experience with us doing that, those friends that were new to it were like, Hey, what are we doing? Like, what is this? What is this right. magic of which you speak? Right. And so we started to have a conversation about how that's what we do. And right. this is what you might say. And, the, and these and were so experienced that, folks, but they had never really just had that conversation. Right. right and they right. had disclosed that essentially their experiences had been very swingery date-ish rather than more cheese plate-ish. And so they, um, it was new for them and they really liked it, which I thought was cool. But yes, you did gong me. You all did. They liked but, the orgy or they liked the circle? They liked both. Yeah. Um, but what was funny for me was I had tried to get the ball rolling and started with the consent circle conversation. And then I totally like fell flat on my face and also fell flat on my face, um, during the consent circle when I basically stated I was simply into everyone and everybody knew me. Yeah, and, and that's all was, I said. There was nothing, and, and you said nothing else. I said nothing about nothing useful whatsoever. Like I, that is I, true. I was the exact opposite of what you want to do during a consent yeah, circle. Yeah, like the second person was like, um, yeah, I like to practice uh, safe sex, and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, me too, yeah. So they didn't that, actually say I like to practice safe sex. Like they were very clear safer. about it. like. They were, they were very explicit. Like they didn't even, they did an awesome job. They did. And, and I was like the exact opposite of awesome job. Ginger Bentham is a podcast co-host and a longtime writer, both published and virtual. You can find her writing at lifeontheswingset.com slash author slash ginger and at gingerandtheproff.blogspot.com. You can hear her every week on Life on the Swing Set at www.lifeonthewingset.com. You can find her and the professor on Twitter at Ginger and the Prof. So a couple of months ago, a friend of mine asked, Hey, are you going to the show later this week? I asked what show, and they told me about a monthly sex-positive variety show featuring comedy, song, burlesque, stories, games, and that it was probably right up my alley. So I went, and to my surprise, Coop and the gang were there. I stumbled on him yelling about his first prostate orgasm. So, since none of us had a recorder, I rightly scolded him later and told him to do better, so he did. He stood up in front of that live audience, that very lively audience actually, uh, and in front of the wonderful Mary Z and Eric Berry to tell us about how to hide a sex swing. Groups of people. So, uh, 
I'm going to read you an essay, and I'm going to give you some knowledge. Are you ready for me to drop some? Oh, this microphone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Are you ready to get some knowledge dropped yeah. right on your chest? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to teach you how to hide a sex switch. Sound good? So you've done it. You've purchased a sex swing. You've gone ahead and joined the ranks of people with sex swing. (laughs) It's safe to say you're not playing at the amateur level anymore. Congratulate yourself on the excitement, your perviness, and most importantly, your willingness to hang yourself or others from the ceiling. Most people don't give it much of a thought when purchasing the sex swing, but in order to make sure no one crashes to the ground and hurts themselves, you're going to want to put a big old eye hook in a beam in your ceiling. By doing this, you're making a bold statement, and one that most people, even vanilla people, can figure out. Something big gets hooked there. Looking around your bedroom will likely yield nothing in the way of punching bags, or other miscellany that might be hung from it. But what are they doing in your bedroom anyway? Narrowing their eyes, clucking their tongues, and knowing exactly what you get up to in the wee small hours that you get incredible kicks from things they'll never know. This is not their business. They have no right to form negative opinions based on this newly discovered information. We all make sometimes significant concessions to friends and family in what should be our private space. Or at the very least, only open to those who wouldn't mind. Or those who would immediately call dibs are next. (laughs) Humbly, I suggest you tell them to fuck off. I'll assume, however, that since you are still here listening to me, you'd like to know how to hide a sex swing. Throw it in the closet. Hit it. (laughs) Oh. Hiding the sex swing isn't really the problem, you say. It's that eye hook that you ran over to Home Depot to pick up, the massive one, the one that's going to gleam its stainless steel gleam from your ceiling, daring your guests to wonder what its nefarious purpose might be. And it's not like it's the 70s or 80s, and you could just throw a macrame planner on that. (laughs) So what are you going to do? Step one, buy a sex swing. I'm going to just go ahead and assume you've got this one covered. If not, why don't you go do that? I'll wait. (laughs) Step two. Determine where to hang it. This is important. Because you want to have freedom of movement as well as floor space for your partner to stand on, to put it in, to uh, fit it up. Do one or two odd jobs. The other part of determining where to hang this swing is figuring out the support structure. So find a stud, then ask him to use a stud finder. (laughs) Drill your hole, screw that eye hook in, and hang that swing up. Why? Because then you can do step three. Step three, fuck in the sex swing. Come on, you've been waiting long enough, don't you think? Parents aren't coming over now to inspect your bedroom ceiling, after all. Hang the swing, throw your partner in it, and go to town. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) This is also a good opportunity to check out that aforementioned freedom of movement. Because you want to make sure that this thing is in the right place for real. If not, sadly, unscrew that bolt and add spackle to your next home depot shop. <laughs> then repeat step two. Well, then you're done. Congratulations, you have a sex swing that you fucked in. That's got to be a sexual bucket list thing to check off, right? <laughs> wait, wait, oh, oh, you're not ready to tell your parents to fuck off about the sex swing? Or that niece that likes to lay on top of the coats on the bed at Thanksgiving? <laughs> gotcha. Well, we can't all be as belligerent as I am. You're probably better at that whole winning friends and influencing people thing, right? <laughs> Don't worry, we'll move on to phase two of this project. How to hide a sex swing eye hook. Step four, buy a smoke detector. This one's easy. And now remember, this thing won't actually be detecting smoke. 
So don't read the box to find out its features. The only burning it'll be detecting is the one in your loins. <laughs> Soft core corny way. With that in mind, just head over to your finest dollar emporium and pick yourself up the finest piece of shit smoke detector you've ever seen. Just make sure it's as deep as your eye hook's eye. Step five, break that smoke detector. <laughs> Open that bad boy up and take out its guts. You don't want to have the stupid battery um, chirping, endless chirp every night right above your bed and then you forget about it. Pull as much of the electronics out as you possibly can. Drill a hole in the center with that same drill bit you used on the ceiling. Step six, attach smoke detector to the ceiling. Line up the holes. <coughs> Something you should be good at. <laughs> Non-monogamous and all, see what I did there? <laughs> and screw that thing up. Something else. But you should be, never mind. Odds <laughs> are that the hook in the center is going to be more than enough to hold the smoke alarm in place. But if not, go ahead and use the screws that came with it. Step seven. Fuck in the sex swing. <laughs> Do it again to celebrate. Also, to make sure the shell of the former smoke alarm doesn't come crashing down upon you. <laughs> Step eight, hide the sex swing. <laughs> Throw the sex swing in the closet. Possibly the laundry first, depending on how filthy you are and how washable your swing is. <laughs> and put the top of the smoke alarm onto the base, hiding the eye hook and creating the perfect camouflage. No one will be any the wiser. You know, it except that firefighter guest who notices there's no red light to indicate that it's working. <laughs> but then you could always show him its true purpose and seduce him. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Since I already told you where to find Cooper earlier, you can find information on Minaj Aha's upcoming shows at facebook.com slash Minaj Aha and at Minaj Aha on Twitter. Every so often, I have to grab a soapbox and talk at people. Why? Well, I do a lot of trying to pull people together, uh, showing everyone we all have common ground and that even if we're building different trails into getting what we all want, they're all eventually going to lead to the same camp. Except for when they don't. And I'm just going to leave it at that and allow myself to introduce myself while I call out my people, the Swingers. Hi. We received a letter with feedback, comments, and a significant amount of frustration from a listener this week regarding our latest BedCast episode. And for those of you that don't know uh, what a BedCast is, it's episode 203, a.k.a. A New Beginning, Loin on the Swine Set. And if you're going to listen so you know what I'm talking about uh, when you hear me kind of talk about it with disdain, keep in mind that you can find it at lifeontheswingset.com slash what the fuck. So you know what you're in for. Every so often we get a letter that touches us, whether it's in a loving like aw way or a grudging acknowledgement way, which is usually me, uh, an angry way, which is usually Cooper, or a well shit way. And we take the time to really think about how to respond both out of respect for you who took the time to send it to us and – to kind of step back and gauge how we feel before we respond. And after opening this letter, we all collectively kind of had a well shit moment and we didn't quite know what to do with it. When it comes to politics, we're a very US centric show. And on this badcast, we decided, well, I'm not sure we really decided as much as it came up as it was happening, uh, but new and raw stuff happens all the time. And we decided to discuss the Indiana Religious Freedom Restoration Act from March 2015. And we didn't so much as discuss the law as riff on how unimaginable it was that we're still dealing with the shit and uh, that we're still attacking people uh, because of the way that they decide to live. Um, and we ended up attacking the people that were both pushing the law and were making excuses for those pushing the law. During the show, we expressed outrage that people from our community could ever possibly support such a law, 
or continue being a part of a religion or part of a movement or part of a political party that allows a lot that kind of law to exist, but also actively promotes that law and uh, promotes it as being patriotic and freedom loving and something worth doing. Uh, we we brought up hashtag not all Christians and hashtag not all Republicans, and we pointed our finger squarely where we felt it was deserved at Christians, at conservatives, and at Republicans. And I kind of did something similar a few bedcasts ago. Uh, we seem to have a pattern of doing this kind of thing on bedcasts, but it was our second bedcast. It was episode 111. And in that 92 minute bedcast, I ended up yelling, I ended up jumping up on the bed and spitting fire directly at Catholics. And I came back around at the end of the episode and I said, I understand where you're at and I understand how it feels. I've been there. And even if you don't agree with what's going on, you can still actively make your world and your community and your religion a better place. And if you don't, you absolutely deserve everything that I just gave you. And I've said both then and in the recent past to Christians and to conservatives and to Republicans, your silence is complicity. We're way past the point where we can keep our heads down and be silent because it doesn't affect us. And here in the swinger community, we're a majority white and a majority affluent population. And we're not just reaping the benefits of our good work and our place in this world, but we're being the benefits of our chosen lifestyle. We're benefiting from being able to hide our extracurricular activities, and we're benefiting from the experience and education we've received, both indirectly and directly, from the other communities that either don't or can't hide who they are. So, yeah, we're angry, and we're still fucking angry. And we're rightfully angry because people are still fighting for the right to discriminate, and the right to deny people services, and the right to actively hold people down, the right to spit on a group of people and consider them lesser. The thing is, we have more in common with those communities who have been and are continuing to incur the costs of existing in a world with people that hate and actively act to deny their existence or make that existence as horrible as possible than we do with people that are actively doing the hating and the denying. We have more in common now with the expanded LGBT community than with Christians, conservatives, or Republicans, whether we acknowledge it or not. We want the freedom to practice our religion as we see fit, to live our lives as we see fit, and to love the people that we love and be left alone to do so. We all fucking want that. And if you don't, you take action to deny somebody else's freedom, or you sit quietly while others in your community take those actions. And that means if you do that, you're at best complicit and at worst contributing to the problem. But, and believe me, this is a big but, we, we know not all Christians and not all conservatives and not all Republicans are complicit. We know that many of you aren't, and we know that many of you speak up and tell members of your community that that's not okay, and you don't represent all of us. Or stop it, you're misrepresenting what we're all about. Uh, we, we, need, we, we, we appreciate that you're speaking up and vocally supporting gay marriage and vociferously condemning those who pursue the denigration of others. And in the very real, very raw, and sometimes frustrated for lack of any concrete ability to change things, anger that we had, we forgot that. We laughed and uh, we used the hashtags as a weapon against everyone. We were indiscriminate and we were sloppy. We made you feel like you can't be a part of our community if we don't all think or feel or practice and express ourselves the same way. And that wasn't okay. We want and we need you in this community. And we want to be part of this community. We want this to be our community and we want us all to hold our arms out wide, embrace our diversity of thought and expression and background. And we need to continue having these discussions. And we here on the swing set, I need you to continue telling us if we've missed the mark or if we've gone too far, if we've offended you, or honestly, if we ever happen to be right on the target. We haven't always been liberal or progressive or atheists, but us liberal progressive atheists lose perspective sometimes. So we can go a little batty and we occasionally lash out at the first thing that angers us because there's so much injustice out there in the world now. But we're not mad at you. So to those of you we pointed fingers at and blamed for all the problems of the world in Indiana, we'll do better. We may disagree, we may have passionate arguments, and we may yell at each other every so often, but at the end of the day, let's shake hands, give each other pats on the back, and fuck each other until the sun comes up. I remember recording that and very seriously trying to suppress the urge to stand up and start yelling. A lot of very awesome people have a lot of opinions on this, but that's where I land. And I hope, when taken in the context of everything else happening in the world, you'll at least understand where it's coming from. And honestly, if that means we can all understand each other, I think we'll all be uh, a lot better off.
This was a recording taken from the Gentle Perverts Social Club's membership, All of Us. You can find more Gentle Perverts podcasts every month at www.gentleperverts.com and discuss our latest episodes and topics at reddit.com slash r slash swingsetfm or on Twitter at hashtag GPSC and at Gentle Perverts. You can find me, Dylan Thomas, on Twitter, Facebook, Spotify, and FetLife at Dylan the Thomas. If you have a submission, a story, a signal boost request, or an idea for a topic, send that to Dylan at lifeontheswingset.com. Thanks for stopping in, and please come back soon.